So good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody who's been able to join us today for a webinar on higher education in India. Uh, my name is Michael Green. I'm the Director for Client and Stakeholder Relations at SANMS4 uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, SANMS4 is a market entry uh, consultancy uh, and higher education happens to be um, you know, our most, uh, our largest kind of sector in terms of our uh, in-house expertise. And I'm uh, pleased to have Lakshmi Iyer, who heads higher education for us on the line, uh, as well as uh, Benita Mara from Kegler Brown and Ashley from uh, Ohio State University. Um, I think the purpose of today's webinar is really to give uh, the participants an end-to-end -end view of um, you know, how universities are interacting with India, what key objectives they're um, uh, taking on in the market, and then how from a legal perspective and a practical perspective the universities are handling, um, handling those object objectives and moving things forward. Um, so just to set the, uh, set the stage for everyone, um, are both um, in Columbus, Ohio, and we'll start with Ashley um, to provide a bit of an overview on Ohio State University's uh, presence in India, why they're in India, why India is important to them. Uh, then we'll move to Vanita, who will provide uh, everybody uh, a very, um, a ve very good presentation on how universities uh, go ahead and actually set up their legal presence in India. Um, from a compliance standpoint and otherwise. Um, after that, we'll move to uh, Lakshmi Iyer, who's based in Delhi right now. And um, uh, she will speak, you know, more to bo both kind of pre-entity um, options and practical considerations, and then also, you know, post-entity. Uh, after an entity is kind of formed in the market, how do uh, the universities go ahead and kind of maintain them from a compliance perspective? Um, at the end of the conversation, we hope to have uh, a question and answer. Feel free to send any questions that you have throughout the presentation um, along to us, and uh, we'll take them and hold them for the end um, of our discussion here. Uh, we've budgeted an hour, hour of time for this uh, webinar. Uh, but for those, you know, if, if the Q&A is uh, uh, particularly active, we want to be here and be as helpful as possible to you. So uh, the speakers have agreed to stay on, you know, post the hour um, to answer any lingering questions that you might have. Um, so with that, uh, Ashley, I'd like to just turn it over to you to really set the stage for uh, the webinar and understand from you you know, what are Ohio State University's priorities uh, in India and why, why India, I guess. So over to you. All right. So I'm from um, Ohio State University. It is a top 12 research university. It's a land grant um, campus. We have about 60,000 students, 18 colleges, 200 majors. Um, and then the strategic vision to expand internationally is to establish a physical presence um, in countries um, which we call the global gateways. Uh, we have an office in China, India, and Brazil. Uh, China was in 2010, India in 2012, and then Brazil in 2014. Um, so why India? Um, India is predicted to be the largest economy by 2050. Um, Ohio State has had a very long-standing relationship with India. Um, it started with um, Punjab Agricultural University. Um, that has been um, just a partnership that we've really capitalized on. Ohio State's a land grant institution, so agriculture is very important to us. So we've just continued to build upon that. Um, instead of establishing a brick and mortar campus um, that offers classes, we've gone the route of gateways that serve as embassies for Ohio State. So it is a standalone entity that we've established in those countries. We serve students, staff, faculty, corporations. Um, we don't offer classes, but again, we facilitate any sort of um, traffic between Ohio State and India that comes and goes. 
um, to establish those entities. They are, again, a standalone entity. In India, we have a private limited corporation. Um, it's similar to what an LLC would be in the state of Ohio. And then we engage with um, a law firm here, such as Kegar Brown, and then um, a law firm in India to kind of navigate how we establish that presence and maintain it. So Ashley, I guess at the outset, what were, I guess, the initial concerns and considerations, I guess, before establishing an entity? What exactly triggered um, uh, Ohio State University to kind of move that, move that direction? And what, what was your experience kind of going through that process? So what we um, determined was this shouldn't be a top-down approach from the university. Um, what we did is we took a look at our faculty and where most of our um, relationships were. Did they have more relationships with um, universities in China, um, in India, and in the UK? And we discovered that most of the relationships were in China, India, and Brazil. So that was how we came up with a strategy to um, open the gateway offices in those countries. Um, it's been a little bit of a challenge on the student side to get students to understand why India is so important, but we've really um, had a lot of good faculty and research collaborations with India, and we hope that that will trickle into students understanding why India is so important and going to be so important moving forward. Uh, and I think you, uh, you know, previously had mentioned about the International Corporate Partnership Program. Could you speak a little bit more about that, how, um, how that program has benefited from Ohio State University's interaction with India? Right. So I really think having a local presence there has really um, helped. We've reconnected with our alumni that um, we've discovered you know, our top executives in these corporations. And so having an office there, identifying those alumni and identifying those corporations, we then tie that back and connect them with faculty, staff, and students that can help those corporations. Um, we help the executives find faculty members that can help with joint research or we help them identify students that can intern in those companies, maybe lead to future positions. So really having that presence there has really helped us find ways to connect um, Ohio State and India. And in terms of you know, interacting with the uh, alumni, what, what other activities has the you know, gateways opened up for Ohio State? You know, are you is the school more focused on, you know, is the alumni relations and fundraising team more active in the market now through the gateway? Um, are there, you know, regular events being held? What, what, how has the uh, gateway kind of opened up more activity? And I guess also what, what activity was happening prior um, to the gateway being, being formed as well? So historically, uh, Ohio State did not track their international alumni once they left campus, um, once they left the US. So our office have, has kind of gone in there and done a grassroots effort where we have gone out and we have found the alumni that are now living there. Um, so I wouldn't say it's more, the strategy is not fundraising. It's really right now just getting them connected back to the university. Um, we found that we can utilize the alumni in India um, beyond just getting money from them. We've really asked them to help with faculty research, with um, identifying students to do internships or any sort of career opportunities. We find that relationship much more valuable than the fundraising aspect from them. OK. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, the spring break program and study abroad, could you um, expand on that a little bit in terms of, you know, how has, you know, the, uh, the gateway and interaction with India kind of expanded upon the curriculum? Yes. 
So uh, any sort of education abroad program is really driven from the academic unit. We serve as the facilitator to that. And the way our office has helped is the struggle we have with finding partner universities in India is that they don't have an international office or they don't have one point of contact at that university. And so what our office in India does is serve as that point of contact and they work with the Indian University um, to talk with them to establish logistics such as getting them there, where they're going to live. Our office can kind of scout those opportunities that an international office in the U.S. would do that, but because the Indian universities don't have that, our office can kind of serve as that. They can help, um, you know, identify those safety opportunities that may be our point of contact at the partner institution can't do for us. And in terms of the, you know, partner institutions and uh, Ohio State's reach within um, within India, I know you all are active in Ahmedabad, Hyderabad, Manipal, Bangalore, Mumbai, and a few other locations. How does the university go ahead and, you know, develop those uh, those kind of outposts and that activity? Um, I guess you know, and 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 where do you see the university kind of going forward in that sense? It's it um it's really up to the faculty and academic unit. So our office. We're here to help them. If a faculty member wants to go to Hyderabad or they want to go to Ahmedabad, we can help them identify a partner. Um, but the academic and the core mission of that program has to be driven by that faculty member, by that academic unit. So, you know, we're really at their disposal. Um, if they want to go somewhere, they kind of give us the idea and we kind of run with it and we help. Um, you know, make it a reality for them. We help um, identify the institution. We help coordinate all the logistics for them. We're just facilitating so we can't drive it, but mm -hmm. we will help move it forward as much as we can. Um, we really, we have faculty advisory committees um, that meet quarterly and we, you know, let them know of any university that approaches us where they want Ohio State students to come and so we'll put that idea out there, um, try and get interest. And so we try and make those connections as much as we can, but ultimately it comes down to the faculty and academic unit to put it into play. That's actually a good point. In terms of internally, so you mentioned the faculty advisory committee. How has Ohio State really wrapped its arms around India in terms of developing a broader strategy and having buy-in from faculty? Or is this you know, faculty advisory committee, is that the, the core group really moving the, the, the ball forward in terms of uh, interaction with India? Yes, we took that approach to find really faculty champions. Um, it can't be a top-down approach is what we've experienced. We can't come down on the faculty and say, we need you to do this, we need you to, to go to India, we need you to find a partner. Um, we really go to the faculty and say, what sort of research do you want to do? Um, what areas have you found? What um, Indian institutions do you have partnerships with? And then we help facilitate and cultivate those. Um, it really has to come from our faculty um, to develop those relationships. We can't push it upon them, but we help facilitate that in any way we can. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much for providing a, a broader overview of what um, Ohio State is up to. And I've already had a couple questions come in, uh, but we'll hold them till the end and Ashley come back to you on, on those fronts. Um, so I think now, uh, Vanita, if, if, if you're ready to, ready to roll, I'll turn it over to you to really provide, you know, kind of the context in terms of legally and, you know, it's, it's really kind of, the work that you've done that's allowed Ohio State to really kind of spread its wings in the market. So over to you. Thanks, uh, Michael. Uh, uh, just for the background, I lead the global education practice at Kegler Brown. We work a lot with universities who want to expand globally 
India and China being the sweet spot these days because everybody wants to be in India and China. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 to 20 minutes that I have is give an overview of the key issues that any university should at least be aware of or should consider if they are looking at um, expanding or uh, going to uh, India. And actually, I can't get my PowerPoint to move. Uh, one second. Uh, all right, I just okay. moved it for you. There we go. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, Michael, if you can just take care of that because I'm having trouble moving it from you uh, for some reason. Okay, it's working now, I guess. So if you look at the the, uh, the regulatory environment, uh, it's pretty uh, uh, the framework governing education sector in India is pretty complicated, uh, and uh, and if you look at the way higher education is basically broadly categorized in India, it's categorized under technical education and what we call non-technical education. And technical education is actually defined as research and training in engineering, uh, architecture, management programs, applied arts program. All of those kinds of programs will fall under the definition of technical education. And actually, the uh, technical education then is governed by a statutory uh, body in India called the All India Council for Technical Education, which is in the acronym is AICTE. They oversee all tech uh, technical education that lead to an award, degree, or a diploma uh, in uh, India. And non-technical education is defined as, or it refers to courses other than technical courses and the governing body that kinds of oversees non-technical education in India is called the University Grant Commission. The acronym is UGC. The key thing to consider is that both these uh, governing bodies, the AICT and the UGC, they have foreign university regulations uh, that uh, they have propagated, uh, which applies to foreign universities who are looking at collaborations in uh, India. These regulations generally it facilitates the entry of foreign educational institutes in India uh, by way of uh, collaboration with an Indian university uh, if it leads to imparting of um, education and leading to awarding of degree, uh, diploma, uh, or you know any uh, post-graduate uh, uh, degrees. You know, uh, uh, so that's really important to understand that the framework is pretty complicated when it comes to collaborations which leads to the awarding of degrees and uh, uh, diploma. Um, on to the next slide. Uh, there are various uh, avenues uh, which can be used uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, education. There are universities, there are deemed universities, there are colleges, there are private universities. Uh, each of these uh, are governed by different statutory bodies, like I mentioned, the AICT, the UGC. Uh, and so there are definitely different uh, avenues involved. Uh, in terms of uh, meeting up with partners for collaborations. Uh, but however, the big question is what does higher education uh, uh, include in, uh, uh, in, in India? Again, it's very uh, convoluted and complicated because generally the higher education uh, in India is again divided into what we loosely call a regular uh, and uh, the series of educational programs which are regulated in India and there are some which are not, un uh, which are not regulated. And the regulated programs are such as the diploma courses, bachelor degrees, master degrees, all of those are actually uh, uh, covered mostly by the AICT and the UGC regulation. But India has a completely separate uh, uh, set of uh, unregulated programs, which is what we actually see a lot of universities getting into. Uh, there hasn't been any regulations to govern these programs. Uh, such as certification courses. As long as these certificates do not lead to award or a diploma or a degree, uh, vocational training programs are some of that. And then there's tutoring coaches and classes. Uh, uh, and then the online education program, uh, India currently does not have any specific regulation governing offering of education courses through online medium for foreign institutions. They did have a distance uh, educational council which used to govern online education. That actually got dissolved in 2013, and India is still working on propagating new rules that apply to distance uh, learning education. So uh, in terms of the framework that the universities can use uh, 
for uh, uh, operating in India. So if any foreign educational institute who is looking to operate in the Indian market, for instance, for providing training certification or corporate executive programs or similar programs, sort of the unregulated programs as we were calling, you could consider a couple of uh, following options. One is you could consider to be in India without having any presence, and Lakshmi will talk about a little bit more in her presentation as to how that's possible. Uh, the other ways is you could have a temporary form of presence in India by way of what we call a liaison office. We'll talk about that too. And then there's a for-profit presence uh, entity option such as the private limited company, which Ashley spoke about, which OSU uh, formed in uh, India. And then there are not for profit options in terms of having a Section 8 company, which is similar to the 501c3 concept we have here uh, in the US. Uh, so if you look at a university not having a presence uh, in India, uh, uh, as, as we as just I mentioned, foreign universities are not allowed to conduct regulated programs uh, independently in, in India. They have to enter into uh, some relationship with the uh, 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 Indian educational institution if they want to run uh, programs. So what we see, the model that works uh, when they don't want to have brick and mortar presence there is entering into a license of services agreement uh, with, the US, with the Indian university whereby they license their brand, their IP, their curriculum, uh, also their best practices. They provide services such as training, mentoring, and teaching to the Indian institute. And sometimes even the twinning program is uh, kind of built into this licensing arrangement where students can pursue both the Indian uh, degrees in both the Indian and the U.S. institution. In such a licensing arrangement, what happens is uh, most of the time uh, uh, these uh, universities in return, uh, as income, uh, they get royalty fees and they get, uh, uh, if services are provided, what we call fees for included services. And that could be for the, you know, the curriculum that's licensed, the intellectual property that's given, and you know, if there's any consulting work that's going on, they can get uh, fees uh, in uh, return for that. However, the biggest issue to keep in mind is that uh, the tax issues. You know, uh, in any such licensing arrangement, mm -hmm. even though the university may be a not-for-profit here in the U.S., is not considered as a not-for-profit or tax-exempted in India. So there would be withholding taxes on any of those payments that are provided to the U.S. university. And then most importantly, if those services that are being provided uh, or the payments that are being given, if they are not considered to be royalty payments, as we call it, or service payments, uh, they, that may not be taxable in India as long as what we call uh, a university not creating a, con a tax concept of permanent establishment. I'll talk a little bit about the PE in a later slide, but that's a very important concept because if a university creates a permanent establishment or a PE as the acronym is called, then the um, entire revenue which is attributable to that PE in India could be taxed at uh, 40%. Um, so these are some tax issues to watch out in those arrangements. Uh, very important when you're setting up uh, these kind of contracts to uh, Keep in mind and consider what will be the tax implication of those that. Another uh, uh, form of uh, temporary uh, presence in India is getting a liaison office. Generally, a liaison office can be used for what we call preparation and auxiliary activities, such as getting, collecting information about the market, acting as a communication channel between the university and others in uh, India. And sometimes it's used for marketing the university in India for recruiting students. However, it's important to remember that a liaison office cannot undertake any commercial activities. So it cannot be a profit generating uh, office. It purely uh, has to do the work of, uh, that is entailed uh, for a representative <laughs> office. But a liaison office uh, needs approval of the Reserve Bank of India. And sometimes the Indian government at various department levels is consulted before giving approval for offices uh, uh, of not-for-profit organizations. In our experience, whenever we've set up a liaison office for universities in India, uh, at least uh, it's taken a long time to do that because the approval process goes through a number of departments in the Indian government uh, for approval. The other option is, as actually mentioned, that OSU did was setting up a, a for-profit presence in India through what we call a private limited uh, uh, company. A private limited uh, company is uh, uh, can generally be used to undertake uh, 
uh, full-fledged operations uh, in India. Uh, uh, next slide, Michael. Uh, and mostly what happens is uh, in that uh, scenario, uh, generally uh, most of these companies uh, like to uh, have, or most of these universities would like to have a private limited company option to take care of the unregulated education courses, like the executive training programs, the vocational training programs, all of that can be housed in a, in a for-profit entity like a private limited company. And also the PLC makes uh, a lot of sense uh, if you're undertaking activities in India which will expose the university, uh, uh, which will expose the university to, uh, in, in various ways, in the PE risk that I mentioned, uh, uh, to uh, avoid the tax implication that we have uh, uh, in India through the PE concept of that 40%. And then most importantly, 100% uh, foreign direct investment uh, is permitted in um, a private limited companies. So a university can fund its operations uh, in India by way of equity, by putting in money as equity in the private limited company. There could be some loan options depending on what the uh, loans will be used for. So it gives a lot of flexibility even in terms of funding uh, the operations uh, of the uh, uh, company uh, if possible. Uh, if funding is one of the issues uh, the university has to face if they have to have multiple operations uh, in India. Another option uh, is the not-for-profit option. Uh, in India, this option really makes sense uh, for universities who want to undertake regulated educational activity in India because the uh, uh, regulated educational activity in India must be undertaken uh, in terms of you know, imparting of the degrees or the diplomas and so on uh, only uh, through a not-for-profit uh, uh, entity. Uh, various options for a not-for-profit uh, entity is basically um, a trust, a society, uh, or a Section uh, 25 company. Uh, it's actually called the Section 25 company. Uh, it was actually uh, called a Section uh, uh, 25 company under the Old Companies Act. It's actually called the Section 8 company uh, now under the new uh, uh, Act. So definitely it helps to have uh, a not-for-profit option uh, in the event if you want to undertake uh, regulated uh, activities in uh, India. And um, the most important thing about a not-for-profit option is a profit of such entity cannot be repatriated back outside of India. Uh, so uh, universities may want to consider if the not-for-profit is going to make money in India, uh, there's not going to be an avenue to get that back to the U.S. And then you may want to put in place a corporate structure which creates some value under a service model to get some money uh, by way of uh, means of providing services to the not-for-profit. Uh, going, moving on, uh, there are certain key legal issues that every company or university must consider when they're going to India in terms of collaboration, setting up entities in India, hiring employees, uh, and some of those key issues are noted in the slide that I'm sharing with you all. Just to d delve a little bit deeper into uh, some of those issues is intellectual property protection is the most important issue that we advise our university clients. So, uh, as uh, many of you all may know, intellectual property protection, or most importantly, trademark protection, are country specific. Uh, in um, uh, are country specific. So, in the event if you have your trademarks registered here in the U.S., does not mean that those trademark protections will be translated into the Indian market. You would have to make separate applications in India to protect your trademark. And the important thing to consider is India is a first to file jurisdiction, so which means whoever files the mark or the trademark application first gets the right to it. We have come across instances where universities here did not protect their trademark in India, and now we saw there was some poaching of marks of U.S. universities, and we've been involved in a couple of legal battles where we're trying to get uh, the trademark rights of our U.S. clients enforced in that country. So trademark protection becomes really important, especially in the licensing arrangement. Uh, we also advise that if you're doing licensing arrangements or collaborations, you should consider to provide your band, brand usage guidelines uh, to uh, your Indian partners to specify uh, the manner in which the trademark will be used and uh, how it will be used and who will use the trademark uh, it's really important to get into details on IP protection. 
Uh, and there's always a separation of IP issue. If you're going to jointly use trademarks, create jointly use trademarks, if there's a divorce between you and your Indian uh, partner, who owns those trademarks? All of these things should be considered and negotiated uh, up front. Uh, the copyright uh, materials uh, are pretty uh, also protected in India. As in, U.S. is a party to the Bonn Convention, and so is India. Most of the copyright material which are created in the U.S. is automatically protected in India. However, you may want to consider that if you're giving any copyrighted materials to your Indian uh, party, in case if any amendments are made to those materials upon inputs from the Indian University, who will own such amended materials? Uh, you also may want to set down some criteria as to how will jointly developed materials be owned in terms of ownership and who's responsible uh, for that. Moving on, um, while doing business in India, foreign educational institutes uh, should insist on having robust documentation to capture the commercial understanding of the parties and to also consider key uh, legal clauses. So we see enough uh, one pages and two pages MOU for substantial collaborations and key provisions are sometimes overlooked in those MOUs. Uh, some of those key provisions is must uh, consider to have trade secrets and confidentiality uh, clauses uh, because the trade secret and confidential information in India is protected through confidentiality agreements. India does not have a trade secret law, uh, which makes it a little difficult from a statutory perspective. But there have been enough Supreme Court cases where confidential information through confidentiality agreements have been enforced. Uh, so it's important to have those agreements in place. You may want to structure your agreements to ensure protection of what we call equitable rights, such as non-compete, uh, if you want exclusivity in those collaborations, right of first refusal for any future collaborations, and definitely indemnification for any losses or third party uh, claims uh, that could be made against the U.S. University. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is non-compete clauses post-termination of an agreement is difficult to enforce in India. Uh, India does not recognize restrictive covenants which are post the term of the agreement. Another important clause to consider is the dispute resolution and the governing clause. Uh, we see enough agreements where the governing law is maybe the laws of Ohio or another state and the dispute resolution clause requires that the um, dispute is uh, sought out in a court in the U.S. And sometimes that really doesn't help because in case of a dispute with your Indian party and if you're suing them for damages, even if you are able to get a judgment against them here in a court of law in the U.S., you would have to take that judgment to India because it is most likely that the Indian party has all of its assets uh, in India and has no assets here in the U.S. to pursue. And foreign judgments in India are only enforceable if the country through which the judgment is being enforced has a reciprocity with India. Currently, U.S. does not have a reciprocity with India in terms of enforcing foreign judgment. So you could spend a whole lot of time, up, up to seven to eight years, to enforce a foreign judgment uh, in India. So the alternative to that, sometimes we uh, tell our clients to suggest international arbitration uh, because uh, uh, India is a party to the New York Convention, just as U.S. is a party to New York Convention, and it's much easier to enforce foreign arbitral awards uh, in India. Sometimes you may also want to consider if in your dispute resolution clause you want to have arbitration in India, because if one of the key issues you want to protect is your intellectual property, uh, you would want to get injunctive relief pretty fast uh, if there is a breach. And the easiest way to get an injunctive relief would be if you're doing arbitration in the country rather than doing arbitration outside the country. The other important aspect of contracts you want to make sure, especially in the licensing arrangement or the collaboration involves exchange of money, is how do you protect your account receivables? How do you get money uh, out of your partners or make sure that you have provisions in place to secure your money. And we sometimes suggest you may want to look at negotiating a letter of credit or a bank guarantee or some kind of indemnification in terms of getting uh, the money um, out of that country uh, or getting the Indian uh, partner to pay uh, that. You know, uh, uh, in negotiations, uh, you may want to also keep in mind, and I'm sure Lakshmi will speak to that a little bit, that the, there are cultural differences in negotiation when you're negotiating in India. A uh, very different approach to communication. 
you know, Indian parties may not disagree with you directly. Uh, they may uh, suggest that a matter be discussed at another time uh, because they don't like uh, having negative conversations. So you may you want to uh, keep in mind that there are going to be cultural differences when you're negotiating your contracts or collaborations. And the more you start recognizing that, uh, the process becomes easier to put in place uh, a collaboration. Especially if you're dealing with public universities in India, the contract negotiation can be go expected to go very slowly uh, because you're actually dealing with the government and sometimes uh, the bureaucracy that's involved. Um, you know, and uh, most importantly, believe in the relationship. Uh, uh, relationship building is really important in India, uh, so you want to believe in that. I'll just skip this slide because it talks about what I mentioned. Uh, lastly, just to emphasize a little bit on the tax. Uh, there are tax implications in India. Again, if just because you're a not-for-profit uh, here in the U.S. Uh, does not give you a tax-exempt status in India, so that dividend taxes, if you're going to get money out of the private limited company uh, in terms of dividend distribution, that the tax is paid by the company. Uh, there's withholding taxes on royalties and fees for services, as I mentioned, if there's licensing arrangement. The current tax rate is 10%. Uh, the India and U.S. has a double tax uh, treaty, which can be used to lower your tax rates. Uh, it's 15% under the treaty, so the domestic tax rate is more beneficial. And then most importantly, if you want to get money out of India, there are certain criteria you would have to fulfill. So, for example, a university company must have to submit what they call a tax residency certificate, a TRC in India. Uh, in some instances, a PAN, uh, which is a tax ID, is acquired. The recent budget is actually remove that requirement. And like I said, there is a double taxation treaty between India and U.S., so you can avail the lower tax rate. And India also has a service tax of 15%, which is generally a, a charge on the services that are provided. And for those who don't have a presence in India, the service tax compliance and burden is on the Indian resident. But something to keep in mind while you are uh, entering into these transactions, there's money involved in it. Uh, ending with tax key issues, India does have very stringent transfer pricing regulations, which means if you're doing transactions with your affiliated entity, so if you have a subsidiary in India, most of those transactions have to be done at arm's length. And then you must avoid the permanent establishment status, which is the PE status, because if you create a PE, you could be exposed to taxes at 40%. Lastly, I just want to tell you that, yes, you do need a visa when you send your faculty down to India. Uh, who do uh, programs and who do training uh, uh, and so on. Uh, we see many instances which sometimes, uh, you know, universities send faculty goes by, go down in their tourist visa, and that's really tourist visa is to do sightseeing, not to do educational activities. So some visas to look out for is the student visa, the employment visa, or the business visa. India also has a separate research visa they give to faculty, which is pretty beneficial. So you must look out for those regulations as to what is the right kind of the visa you would need to go down to India to uh, undertake those collaborations. Um, again, uh, there's the social security rules which apply to expats who go down to India and they live there. So if you have a faculty who's going to be going down and living in India, there would be social security rules to follow. All right, I will just end by saying the two hot topics to look for uh, in the next uh, uh, few months, I would say, India actually came up with a press release in September 2014, which allows foreign universities to set up campus in India as a not-for-profit without having to collaborate with any uh, Indian educational institute. But these regulations have not come out. It's just a press release by the government, so we all are closely watching that. And they also amended the UGC uh, regulations for foreign university, which has actually made the approval process to get approval from UGC to do the regulated activity uh, much uh, easier. Uh, you know, in ending, uh, I just want to tell uh, that it, it may sound very cumbersome and complicated, uh, and the educational regulations in India may appear to be very regressive. However, uh, the government's intent is to open up the education sector for investment and collaboration. So all is very positive towards the government's approach, especially the new government that we have under the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And the opportunities are great there, even though the laws are a little complicated and regressive, but that should not be an impediment uh, to look into that market. I think, Michael, that's for me. Uh, we can move on to the next speaker. Excellent. Uh, Vanita, thank you very much for the 
the overview. Um, and I think there are, you know, lots of complexities in terms of forming uh, an entity in India from a higher education institution's perspective. So many are very familiar with, um, you know, being a nonprofit and being a nonprofit in other jurisdictions. But for some of the reasons you outlined, it makes sense in some cases to consider, uh, you know, for-profit options. Um, uh, Sanam S4 has been working closely with actually both governments, the U.S. and Indian government, to follow some of the developments that you had mentioned at the end of your presentation and to hopefully provide an avenue, um, a working group as such, of, of universities to share some of the uh, key issues that they face um, in terms of operating in the Indian market. Uh, you, mentioned, you, you mentioned the tax issues, uh, but there's several other in terms of, uh, you know, structuring and others. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Lakshmi Iyer. Thank you so much for staying up with us uh, in Delhi. It's quite late over there. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll push it over to your um, presentation. And then if you can, can you uh, control the, do the controls on your own? Or do you need me to yes, move yeah. it around? Yeah. No, I, I'm fine. Okay. I'll, I'll do it on my. Thanks very much, Minita, for um, helping um, set the context. Um, and to all of our attendees from around the world, uh, now that you have heard Vinita talk about the various options for setting up and the key considerations that you should bear in mind, the working group that Ashley um, talked about that OSU successfully pulled together to get their initiative going, some of you would actually be wondering if there are any solutions to help you get boots on the ground while all that is going on in the background. Um, Vinita did mention that you know sometimes setting up entities on the ground in India um, could almost take anywhere between 6 to 18 months, depending on how quickly you get all the paperwork together. And that is where uh, you know uh, one of our key services called Launchpad um, uh, comes into play. It enables you to act local for success. And uh, you know, I just wanted to say a few things based on our experience of um, supporting over 30 odd um, higher ed institutions from different parts of the world. You know, India is a very crowded and a highly competitive market. Uh, the most important thing that people um, kind of sort of struggle with when they come to India is the diversity. You know, we are 29 states, seven union territories, several languages. So we live and breathe diversity. And this is reflected in our education system. You have seen uh, the different kinds of institutions that are there, um, the different types of overarching bodies that determine what they can and cannot do. In all of this, um, it is very, very important to also remember that Indians love face-to-face -face interaction. Um, if there are connections that you have uh, based on you know, faculty of Indian heritage that you have in your midst uh, that you can exploit, please go ahead and do so because we do love connections. And an ongoing commitment to the market has to be shown. Um, uh, you know, it, it would mean that several flights uh, into the country, uh, uh, talking to uh, people. Sometimes you are sat in meetings wondering there is nothing that is happening. And that goes back to uh, a point that uh, Vinita made in her uh, presentation that, you know, sometimes progress can be quite slow. Hence that cultural context, the knowledge of how you can operate in a complex market like this comes very useful. Um, and that is where a service that we offer um, called Launchpad could be quite effective for institutions before they consider ent entering into a, a, a legal entity um, structure. So I'm just going to give you a very broad overview of um, what Launchpad uh, service entails. Um, it is to help you access uh, local expertise um, to drive your agenda forward. Uh, so you would define your India objectives. We would go ahead and identify a suitable individual or individuals depending on the uh, projects or uh, uh, agenda that you have on the ground to act as your dedicated advisors. Um, and we will then support that individual or individuals alongside you 
to ensure that the local objectives are met. So all of the uh, responsibility for the local supervision, the administration and HR demands of those, uh, those individuals will rest with us. So the, the model then enables you to literally have someone who is an extension um, of your international um, setup or uh, uh, you know who will act as an extension of the institution who will carry the who will wear the colors of your uh, or uh, institution wave the flag whatever that you need them to do in terms of building a profile uh, and footprint on the ground so the typical time that uh, you know institutions uh, would need to keep in mind to get this going from the time of signing on a contract uh, is eight to ten weeks which considering uh, the time that we have take we have seen um, some of the legal entities um, to get formed on the ground um, is really quite fast to get going while you figure out how you would want to kind of structure your entity and an interesting point that Vinita did make uh, uh, actually Ashley made was that you know it was not a top driven approach but a bottom up approach based on the requirements that the institution has so identifying all of these different strands bringing the different stakeholders together to get a fit for purpose vehicle going can take time and that is where a service like this can be quite useful for you and the in, uh, the most important uh, thing to understand about the service is that it also allows you seamless transition uh, to your entity um, you know the individual might have shaped up into a very valuable resource uh, for your international uh, agenda and you might want to kind of take that individual into your legal entity structure and we um, help enable uh, that as well for the uh, institution so the typical scenarios um, that we have seen um, where you know the launchpad service uh, become quite useful um, for our customers um, is in terms of profile racing building the brand awareness um, helping unearth alumni um, who who are here in india most institutions do lose contact after the alumni leave so shows of the country um, identifying high net worth individuals uh, for fundraising um, uh, uh, agenda, uh, establishing and maintaining institutional relationships, uh, which are quite critical for partnerships uh, side of things, um, identifying um, uh, inbound kind of uh, talent uh, for uh, recruitment and also uh, student enrollment support. Um, and if you have uh, delegations that are coming in uh, to India, then making sure that they have uh, a good experience um, traveling around the country, um, helping them get to their appointments in time. These things might not look to be great achievements, but in a, in a place like India where, you know, for example, this evening, for me to get from home to the office, I live 10 minutes away from, from the office it took me one hour because it is festival season so these are the challenges uh, that you uh, you know kind of find in a in a place like india which sat several thousands of miles away might not be quite real to you but your local uh, team can help you navigate that quite effectively so what is it that you know uh, the person on launchpad can and cannot do and what are the expectations of the out of the institution and was it that we at sanam s4 will do this takes me back to the point of permanent establishment that um, uh, the tax status that vinita um, emphasized um, uh, at least three times in her presentation and we keep <laughs> talking about p risk in uh, within our organization and it you know i almost smiled to myself when vinita kept talking about p risk and you know People don't understand P risk till the time somebody gives them, uh, you know, a, a bill for 40% taxes. Then you know it becomes really real. <laughs> um, so the advisor can do promotion of your brand, can conduct due diligence on your behalf of on an institution that you would probably want to work with, and recommend 
whether you should be considering them or not and if they are a, you know an institution of your uh, you know a, a peer institution they can gather market intelligence and support any kind of strategy um, that you are trying to kind of build for the institution they can build visibility because for all practical purposes they are an ex they act and behave as an extension of your international but what they cannot do is to sign on behalf of the institution they cannot receive payments they cannot enter into contracts they can't be the decision maker because obviously they are you know they are not you know part of a legal entity setup that you have you do not have a presence in that sense of the word to be able to kind of ask the advisor to enter into contracts on your behalf it's it's not going to happen and as an institution you are the you know the, you you are in control of your strategy you are in control of the direction that you would set for the individual or the team to follow on the ground and you will direct the activities of the of the individual and as sam s4 what we do in the process is to input into your strategy because we live and breathe education and we support institutions from across seven countries we we see on a day to day basis what's going on in 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 the market whether it is you know recruitment partnerships collaborations due diligence so on and so forth and we will be able to kind of sense check some of the ideas at the formulation stage whether you know you are going in the right direction or if someone else has tried something whether it has worked or not and what we can also then do is to once you have figured out how you want to approach this market um we will be able to help you uh, identify the skill sets that you would need to make it work and make it a success uh, in country and we will literally the the word that i keep using is co-parenting um not even co-managing co-parenting the advisor because this is somebody sat several thousands of miles away from you um you know there are time zone differences the cultural differences you know the approach to work everything is different and uh, you know we will be able to kind of put another lens on the individual and say that okay if these things are working out we will be the first one to come and tell you if there are problems then we are there to kind of help you uh, problem solve and collaborate in finding a solution to make this work and last but not the least definitely you know if you are a general and you know going out onto the battlefield with a strategy in place you need tactical soldiers and that's what we do we uh, help you identify the right tactics to get to the end goal now what are the kind of uh, activities that we have seen customers um, using the launchpad model for of course india is the second largest source market for the best and the brightest students and uh, after china so recruitment is is a very big uh, agenda for a lot of our clients um and uh, a lot of uh, in, in you know institutions from newer countries that we find coming through the doors to india they all want the indian student now uh, through the model you can of course help build awareness with a growth objective you know so you want to grow your numbers you can build diversity uh, into your student cohort maybe you know you have too many students from say north india and you do want to make sure that you uh, you strike a good balance in terms of diversity in the classroom um, you might want to build specific student population you know um, a high value student is somebody who is going to come to you for say four years of undergrad education um and you know they would be a, a better fit for the job market they would be um, adding more value to the local economy so you might want to pursue an objective like that or you might have done all of this and you are wanting to leap frog into the second generation goal which is to improve the quality of the students um that you are attracting um uh, from the market the second um, um objective that we do um see uh, customers pursuing through the launchpad service is the partnership um uh, partnership model wherein they uh, identify local institutions um um using the advisor's uh, knowledge um assess the initial interest 
um, and also you know the the advisor is in a position to take it to a certain level which is to identify what kind of models might possibly work and bring it to a stage where the academics then are not wasting their time um, you know making um, visits that are not quite fruitful uh, you can end up meeting 20 people and not find anything because they are not the right people to have been met um, and it was interesting to hear Ashley saying that you know some of the Indian institutions do not have international offices they don't I mean you have to go to multiple people to before something starts moving so these are the kind of uh, activities that can be kind of done locally so that the the time of the academic community uh, is uh, utilized uh, in a manner um, that is quite uh, fruitful for the institution and once you have got to a stage where you have a reasonably robust uh, partnership um, yes they do exist in India uh, then um, you know meeting and the students uh, at the local partner institution you don't need to fly in and fly out for that the person locally um, can help uh, manage that and the third uh, strand that I do see uh, amongst our clients is the due diligence aspect uh, wherein they want to make sure that they are um, uh, building a sustainable applicant um, pipeline so th these are some of the examples uh, now you know obviously these are all uh, activities that are possible through launchpad which exists at the pre-entity stage and then you know Vinita has taken you through that journey that you know and the multiple routes that you can take to form an entity and then comes the post entity setup and uh, there are uh, four different um, strands that you should be aware of you know there is going to be the, the financial uh, and accounting uh, side of things then the corporate legal and secretarial side of things tax and regulatory transfer pricing and you know the audits and finally the HR if you have individuals working within your legal entity how are you ensuring that uh, you know the attendance the retrenchment you know the contract setting everything is in order so these are all services where we do uh, plug into to help our customers I would uh, stop my presentation there and I think uh, Michael has got a, quite a few questions coming through uh, his chat window so very happy to kind of answer any questions that you might have yes thank you Lakshmi um, and thank you everyone for bearing with us I, I realize we're coming up to the top of the hour um, so would like to had a couple questions come in and would like to spin them out to uh, the presenters that we have here today uh, the first one was for Ohio State and they, they had mentioned students are not fully persuaded of India's importance is Ohio State University trying to increase study abroad there or some other student involvement? So I guess what, what's the interaction between the student community in India and what is the administration and the faculty doing to increase it? Right, so I guess I should say this isn't just a problem for Ohio State, this is a trend across universities in the U.S. that we need the students to catch up to where the, you know, the global economy is going. So. Um, it's our education abroad unit um, trying to find faculty members to create good programs to go. Um, Ohio State received the Passport to India um, grant from the U.S. State Department, which increases uh, student traffic between the U.S. and India. So we, um, you know, have tried to find partner institutions to sign on to this to just create awareness across campus. Um, we have targeted groups at Ohio State to take um, trips to India. For instance, we have worked with um, a group called Buckeye Leaders Fellows at Ohio State. They're, they're top students, um, you know, in their, their last years at Ohio State. Um, and so we'll work with that group to take a meaningful um, international trip, and we've taken them to India in the past. So I think um, it's constant education. And then again, finding those faculty partners um, or groups on campus that really want to take a meaningful international trip and telling them to look beyond you know, a European country and go somewhere that's going to make a difference in the economy and that's going to mean more when these students graduate and go out into the workforce. That's helpful. 
Thank you, Ashley. Um, the second question that came in was um, about how, uh, how the higher education in India can help recruit the best product. Also discuss some best practices, how a manager HR can appoint an employee in an organization. Um, it's a bit of a two-part two uh, two question. Uh, maybe the first, first point, maybe uh, Lakshmi, I can turn to you in terms of how does a university go about finding, I guess, the best, the best students? I'm having a little bit difficulty understanding the question, but what, what process um, do you take clients through in terms of developing their uh, recruitment strategy in the market? Okay. Uh, if it is identifying the best students, I mean, the first thing would be to kind of look at uh, the program mix that the institution has. Um, the entry cr criteria that they have set up um, and um, making them understand that India has got over uh, 30 state boards plus central uh, education boards and also open schooling um, and um, you know helping them set reasonably um, good entry criteria that would help them kind of filter out um, students who are not suited um, because ultimately uh, institutions should look at building sustainable pipeline of um, future um, uh, students and uh, bear in mind that uh, the students that they recruit today are going to be their alumni and they really need to go after the best fit student for the institution and um, I think entry criteria is a very important factor in that. Um, and also, uh, the international team should develop a, a good understanding of uh, the financial documents that students uh, present to be able to um, uh, show the funds for uh, getting admission into the program. Uh, and these, again, are quite complex. And it will take time for somebody to kind of learn it afresh. And that is where you know we sort of compress the learning curve because we can help them kind of go through that process quite quickly. Thank you. Um, and Vanita, maybe for you, the, the, the second part of the question in terms of, uh, you know, once a uh, university has maybe set up an entity, how do you go about, you know, uh, bringing employees onto that platform. Again, I think this question, sure. uh, try, trying to parse it out a bit, but uh, thought maybe you sure. could set, shed some light. Yeah, if, if Michael, if the, uh, the question is what are the best practices uh, to appoint an employee, I mean, I can talk about best practices from a legal perspective. Uh, it's very important to know that in India, the labor laws are at the state level as well as at the federal level. And then the Indian laws also make a distinction between what they call exempt employees and non-exempt employees. So depending upon the category of the employee that you're trying to recruit, uh, if, what, uh, it's, if it's a management level employee, uh, you want to definitely uh, make sure that you know, there are proper contracts in place. Uh, if you're going to share your confidential and uh, uh, information with those employees, which in many cases you will, uh, you want to make sure those clauses are appropriately included in those employment agreement. And uh, in some states, uh, there is a particular act, which is the Shop and Establishment Act, which applies to certain employment relationship. You may also want to see that if you do terminate the employee's relationship, uh, would you have to uh, provide them with some severances? So all that due diligence should be done way ahead before even uh, appointing the employees. If you're appointing a non-management or what we call a non-exempt employee, there are a whole lot of statutory laws in India that needs to be followed when it comes to workers' compensation, when it comes to termination of employment, uh, medical insurance. Uh, so due diligence on that should also be done. But from a practical perspective, what we've seen our other clients do when they are hiring employees is um, you want to make sure that you are going to uh, service providers, you know, such as HR placement uh, agencies in that country who understands the market that you are in, what you're looking for, 
in getting that uh, uh, to get to recruit that employees because uh, India is such a localized market that if you are trying to recruit somebody in the in the city of Delhi, the market there is very different from the city of Bangalore. So it's a very localized uh, uh, place uh, as such. So it's really important to work with service providers like Sunamfo and others who can then guide you as to what is the industry standards for recruiting those kind of uh, employees and what would be some of the best practice in terms of salary. Uh, I'm sure Lakshmi will agree with me. What's happening in India recently is there's a lot of attrition of employees. Employees are moving from one uh, uh, jobs to another uh, because there's a demand and supply issue happening in India. There's a huge demand in particular sectors such as education, telecom, uh, find the skill set. And when you do find the skill set, uh, you know, the chances are that you may lose the employee to the next competitor because somebody is paying them higher. So you really need to work with your local service providers who understand the HR market really well in that country uh, because that market is very regionalized and it's very localized and uh, it's, there's no cookie cutter approach in India. One glove does not fit all. So you got to spend your time doing that due diligence and once you have found your partner, uh, your employee, you want to make sure you have the best legal best practices uh, in terms of making sure the right benefits are being provided. You have an employment contract in place. One slide I over miss is India does have an at will employment. However, India does require a notice requirement. If you want to terminate somebody's employment, you've got to give them notice. It's not that you can show up in the office and tell the employee not to come the next day. So you want to make sure you understand those uh, laws. Uh, and then most importantly, if your, if your uh, op organization grows, then you have 10, 15 employees in that country, you want to then make sure you have a proper handbook uh, on you know, data privacy issues there, uh, confidentiality issues put in those handbooks, uh, and that's circulated to those employees. Mm -hmm. Nina, thank you. I think uh, I've, I've received some messages. Folks are kind of uh, uh, turning out for the day. Um, so at, at this point, I'd just like to uh, thank Ashley, Vanita, and Lakshmi for all the preparation that went into putting together these presentations. Uh, we will be in touch um, uh, going forward with uh, all of the registrants and be able to share this information. Uh, I believe there was a few uh, polls that were pushed out to uh, the audience, and if you had a chance to answer them, that's fantastic. That'll help us better serve you going forward in terms of your, um, uh, what you're interested in, in terms of these webinars, what the focus, are, what the focus is going forward. Um, so with that, just like to wish uh, Lakshmi a good evening, uh, Vanita and Ashley a good day, and to all of our participants a good day as well. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.